show because the 4 p.m. show was sold out. Woo! That was a good thing. So, welcome to the Spring 2011 Speech Night by the MJC Speech and Debate Team here on campus. We are proud to present to you speeches and debates and oral interpretations that you will be seeing and doing within your different classes. The students here are from our Speech 100 and 102 classes, 104 and 107, argumentation and debate, but possibly also the 120 and the 122 classes, the oral interpretation of literature. And so tonight we're gonna do a little bit of something for each and every one of you so that it applies to the classes that you're taking this semester here at Modesto Junior College. And what we're really hoping is gonna happen is that maybe some of you out there, oh, excuse me. Uh, if you have a cell phone right now, if you'll please make sure that it's turned off and so there is no beeping and bleeping during the speaker's speeches. champions as well and you'll be meeting some of those state and national winners from last year who are still with the team this year but besides those award-winning things the thing that I'm most proud of with the speech team that is here at Modesto Junior College is that over the past four years seven different individuals from this team have gone on to universities with full ride scholarships to compete for the university's team in speech and debate. Full ride scholarships. And with the way that our economy is to be able to graduate and know that those seven people are graduating without a bill for education is incredible. That's what the MJC speech and debate team can do for people if they really have the drive and they really have the motivation. Three individuals on this year's speech team are being sought after by coaches at universities with full ride scholarships in hand. That's exciting. That's really what makes me proud to be the head coach of the Modesto Junior College Speech and Debate Team. And so now, without any other further delay, let me introduce you to some of the people who are on the team this spring semester. So please give a round of applause to Mr. Doorman, Vishal Bowen, Eric Brown, Amber Dryling, Alyssa Gear, Eric Cobb, Jessica Medina, who will Hopefully, be getting a full ride scholarship to Concordia University. Sarah Ochoa, Walter Spreli, and Wes Vieira. 
part of your spring 2011 speech and debate team here at Modesto Junior College. As the other students do their presentations, we'll be introducing them to you. I'd also like to have a few thank yous as well. Uh, there is a fellow full-time speech instructor here at the college who really pours a tremendous amount of volunteer time in for me and, and really pours his heart into forensics and helps the students out out of the kindness of his heart, uh, putting in countless hours and coming to the class that we have and not being paid for it. But please give a round of applause to Professor Charles Mullins. All of your instructors here at Modesto Junior College really give and put in some time to our team. And that's really what makes it the state and national champions that we have. That they all really help, and I really, truly appreciate their help. The other person who I'd like to, for you to give a special round of applause to, because really this individual is someone who isn't noticed very often on our campus, but there's no way I could run the speech night semester after semester without her. You might have seen her sitting out there in the cold selling tickets to get you in here as quickly as possible. And so if you'll please give a big round of applause to Ms. Barbie Page. And so now let me introduce you to your first speaker of the evening, and her name is Danielle Ramos. Danielle came to the team two years ago, and really she is what we consider one of the Renaissance players on the team. And what I mean about that is that usually a Renaissance player is someone who can play several positions. And in her career on the team, she has taken awards in oral interpretation, which is more of an acting performance type of platform. And just last weekend at a debate tournament at the University of Santa Clara, she came in second place with her debate partner in parliamentary debate, beating out teams from the University of Santa Clara and UC Davis, and then meeting a team in the finals from San Francisco State University. But as a community college competitor, she and her partner took second place. Pretty impressive. And then also, as you'll notice tonight, she also does platform speeches as well. Those are the three different areas of forensics. Usually students just kind of focus on one area, but she has really mastered all of them. And so this evening, Ms. Ramos will be giving to you an informative speech that those of you in speech 100 and 102 will be giving. Simply put, it's a speech where you're introducing a concept and an idea to the audience. And that's what she'll be doing for you this evening. So please give a big round of applause to Danielle Ramos. Michael walks outside to his new shiny red car. He opens the driver's side back door as his yellow lab pops in. As he activates the key to the ignition, the engine comes to life, and the car says, Welcome, Michael. Ready to engage? Michael gently accelerates as his guide dog begins to snooze. Michael is driving a car, and he has been blind since birth. The World Health Organization, July 2009, stated that 314 million people worldwide are severely visually impaired while 45 million are completely blind. According to CBS News, August 25th, 2009, many people living with blindness report that they often feel powerless, independent, and most, most significantly, aware that society sees them as such. According to Business Wire News, November 16th, 2009, that for the blind, driving has become one of life's most misconveniences, a deprivation of what most of us take for granted today. However, the National Federation of the Blind, the NFB, and the University of Virginia Tech have come together to build an automobile that will allow a blind person to drive safely and independently. The Blind Driver Vehicle is a breakthrough technology designed to improve the lives of blind population by changing society's perception and conquering many of the limitations that they face today. Thus, I will first 
discuss the inspiration behind the Blind Driver Challenge. Second, examine some of the key technology used to make the impossible possible before finally looking into the future implications of this vehicle. Let's begin with. It is important that we understand the inspiration behind this brilliant piece of technology. Throughout history, blind people have not only had to deal with the struggles blindness caused alone, but also with the hardship society has placed upon them because of their misguided beliefs. For instance, World Access for the Blind, September 2010, states that one of the most threatening things a blind person faces is the perception the world has of them as helpless independent. Consequently, this prejudice has limited the rehabilitative services and education offered to the blind, hindering them from reaching their full potential. Furthermore, according to the New York Times, January 2009, advocates for the blind state that technology companies have done a poor job of making their products accessible to the blind population. There are many technologies that could have tremendous benefits that could open the doors to new forms of independence, but are not made to meet their needs. However, organizations such as the NFB help the blind population achieve independence through new forms of education, services, and products. They also promote the development of innovative technologies, one being this Blind Driver Challenge. Mark Rigobono, the Executive Director for the NFB, stated in the Braille Monitor of December 2009 that the automobile has powerful symbolic meaning. Driving has come, become so fundamental that many can't imagine a life without it. But the idea that a blind person can drive has not even been a consideration in the majority of people's minds. This perspective, the perspective that sight is required to access technology, has created more barriers for the blind than the actual lack of sight itself. So, in an attempt to change society's views, the NFB began the Blind Driver Challenge as a way to create opportunities for the public to view these people in a different light. Now that we understand the inspiration behind the Blind Driver Challenge, we must look into technology used to make this possible. Fourth <coughs> Technology, October 13, 2010, stated that many autonomous vehicle technologies are used. However, the goal here is not to create a vehicle that will drive the blind, but rather a vehicle that will allow the blind to make important, independent driving decisions. The sensing and perception information that would normally be used in an autonomous vehicle Will instead, be, will instead be passed to the driver through several non-visual interfaces. Dr. Dennis Hong, director of the Robotics and Mechanics Laboratory at Virginia Tech, stated that in order for a blind person to be successfully operate a vehicle, they must first be able to perform three fundamental driving tasks. First, they must be able to be aware of their environment. Second, be able to steer. And third, be able to regulate their speed. But first, in order for a blind person to be able to be aware of what is around them, sensors are used to, sensors are used to scan surrounding environments. A laser ranger finder is used to act as the eyes of the driver. It is attached to the front of the vehicle and shoots out a small laser that bounces off objects to build a map of the environment. Once the laser ranger finder gathers all the information, it then sends it to the blind driver system, a system that consists of various sensors and non-visual interfaces that are all linked to a computer located inside the vehicle. The computer then brings all the information together to calculate the safest direction and speed for the driver. Now once the path through the environment is calculated, the system can then instruct the driver on how to steer in order to stay in the lane and avoid obstacles. This is done through a pair of vibrating gloves called drive grip. The drive grip system consists of a pair of four-finger tactile gloves that have motors attached to each of the fingers. The motors individually vibrate throughout different parts of the driver's hand. The system informs the driver of the need to turn right or left by activating these vibrating motors. More specifically, the system will gradually activate as the motors are gradually intended to turn. What this means is that the driver's hands become more integrated with the turn, allowing them to respond to their environment in a more natural and intuitive way. Now finally, in order to control the speed of their vehicle, the blind driver is given cues on about the need to accelerate or decelerate to wearing other lateral tactile devices. For example, a vibrating vest is worn by the driver to help them regulate their speed. As the driver accelerates, the vibrations in the vest become more intense to match the speed. If the vehicle detects an imminent collision, the vest will violently shake, cueing the driver to stop immediately. Additionally, vibrating tactile shoes are also worn to keep the driver within the speed limit. 
If the driver is operating too far below the speed limit, the shoe will vibrate, informing the driver that there's a need to accelerate. From the laser ranger finder to the back of fiber tactile vest, the creation of this vehicle can truly allow the blind to drive. And thus finally, after taking a look into some of the key technology, it is now essential to look into the future of this vehicle. Mark Rigobono, in an interview with AOL News, March 2010, states that the blind driver challenge is absolutely intended to be real. The process began with Virginia Tech's dune buggy, whose purpose was to test how a blind person interacted with the technology. And according to Virginia Tech, every single person that test drove this vehicle did so successfully. Since the vehicle has been proven to be a success, the goal now is to implement this system into four hybrid state vehicles so that numerous blind drivers could drive from Maryland to Florida this May for the NFB's National Convention, which is a 900-mile trip. This trip will have national and international media coverage, which the NFB hopes will raise awareness of the capabilities of the blind and also create an interest in collaboration for the research and development of new blind access technologies. <coughs> In the Washington Post, August 1st, 2009, Dr. Dennis Hong said, this is not going to be proven at a product until it is proven 100% safe, which he predicts will happen within the next three years. But he foresees the problem will not be getting the technology ready, but rather getting past public perception and the <coughs> legality. However, according to an article by National Instruments, May 2010, even though blind drivers may not be seen on the road for a number of years, Many spin-off technology will come as a result of this vehicle. Dr. Mark Maurer, president of the National Federation of Blind, stated in the Wall Street Journal, August 2010, that the technology being developed to make driving possible will also offer opportunities to the blind in other areas. This will expand the educational and employment opportunities offered because we will be able to learn more about how blind people perceive, gather, and manipulate information. And as a result, technologies can be made more accessible. But the blind driver challenge will not only benefit the blind, but sighted as well. As these devices are proven to be sufficient in allowing a blind person to drive a vehicle, then we can only imagine the benefits of having more than just visual cues for drivers who are drowsy, distracted, or otherwise distracted on the road. Moreover, researchers involved are hoping that from this technology, we could create early warning devices and early mitigation systems for all driving and even flying environments. Additionally, this technology would be especially helpful in bad weather or low visibility conditions. The laser ranger finder can navigate through the night, extreme fog, and even storms better than the human eye. Now we can see that this vehicle has much more research and testing before it is road ready. But scientists will not be giving up, and neither will the NFB. Today, I have shared the inspiration behind the blind driver vehicle. Second, discuss how this vehicle functions. And finally, explore some of the future implications. This new vehicle is aimed at changing the perception of society of shadows on visually impaired, but also to provide a gateway for new advancements in technology in areas such as education, practical applications, and advanced safety systems. For now, many sighted drivers may see this as unrealistic or unnecessary. But with the way technology is advancing, combined with the power of an open mind, this may no longer be a futuristic dream but perhaps a soon possible reality. And as for Michael, pretty soon, we may be seeing him hunting for parking just like the rest of us. Hello there. speaker I'd like to introduce to you. First off, she's one of my favorite people on this planet. And second, she's also one of the most amazing speakers I've ever had the privilege to work with. Uh, Maggie Rolichek will be doing speech to entertain for us tonight. Now this is a socially significant topic, but it's presented in a humorous manner. So it's not a stand-up comedy routine at all, but it's still a very structured research speech. It's yet the, ad the added burden of also being very funny. Maggie Rolichek, this uh, last semester, is now considered the top speech to entertain speaker in all of Northern California. That includes community colleges and universities. So, without any further ado, 
Let me introduce to you the funniest chick in Northern California, Maggie Rolachek. Scares people the most. 
In fact, in 2009, CNN released an article entitled Easy Ways to Exit Awkward Situations, which gave people advice on how to gracefully and painlessly remove yourself from any awkward social situation. It touched on everything from avoiding a telemarketer to escaping dull conversation at parties. And then again in 2010, The Heights, published at Boston University, along with Lifestyle Magazines, both published articles on how to avoid awkward situations. These directed it, were directed at everything from remembering someone's name to introducing someone to, of course, how to get out of that all too awkward situation. See, people are encouraged to run away when faced with potential awkwardness rather than try to cope with that feeling or perhaps embrace it. Basically, we're taught to run away from our feelings rather than try to deal with them. The New York Times has a section of its online paper called Social Cues, where people can send in specific social questions about awkward situations they've been dealt and get advice on how to deal with them in the future. But it isn't just putting ourselves out there that tends to scare people. As a people, we also tend to have a fear of not being liked or being judged. That's probably why, according to a 2010 edition of the Washington Post, a majority of people suffer from cetophobia. Fear of awkward silences. If that demonstration makes you uncomfortable, you may be one of those people. But don't worry, there are groups for those like you. The Facebook group I Hate Awkward Silences has a whopping 46,021 fans. <laughs> That's probably why websites such as HowToTalkWithConfidence.com have entire sections of their website directed at letting people deal with awkward silences. People are encouraged to fill awkward silences with small talk to make other people feel better. Personally, I'm not sure about how asking me about my job at a free clinic is going to be any less awkward than just staying quiet. But people still harbor very deep and very real fears of awkward silences, so much so that they avoid talking to people or even leaving their homes. Now, if Bill Clinton and Kanye West had that problem, all our lives would be a little less awkward. We've even come up with a hand gesture to let people know when we're feeling uncomfortable. No, not that hand gesture. This one, the awkward turtle. Author Lisa Fierstein deemed the awkward turtle the animal mascot of the awkward moment. So now we have a whole ton of ways to avoid awkward situations. But how can we learn to embrace this awkwardness so that we don't become more socially inept than we already are? How can we learn to adore discomfort? Because the question isn't, are we awkward? We are awkward. I'm awkward. You're awkward. That kid. Definitely awkward. And we're all here to stay. So the question we must ask ourselves is how we can learn to cope with this awkwardness. Because awkwardness is kind of like an STD. It's not going to go away because you ignore it. <laughs> Trust me. right when you're dealt it. So if you think someone's checking you out and they aren't, <laughs> well, maybe you just laugh about it and move on. <laughs> After all, we need to stop saying things as awkward and begin to see awkward as normal. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. And don't be afraid of what people are going to think of you. You know what? I want everyone to start right now. All right. Everyone stand up, find someone you don't know, and give them a hug. And I'm 
president of the Speech and Debate Club. Woo! Woo! Yeah! <laughs> this year, the club was interested in, in bringing in a high caliber forensic speaker, and Coach Guy agreed. So, tonight, our persuasive speech will be performed by Rashara Swan. Now, Rashara is a graduate of San Joaquin Delta College and currently competes for the University of the Pacific. Rashara is the interstate oratory champion for Northern California. This is the most prestigious persuasive speaking award in the nation. So, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Rashara Swan performing her award-winning persuasive speech. She went into labor in January of 2004. But after an ultrasound, her doctor informed her that she would have to deliver her baby via C-section since her child appeared to be 13 pounds. However, after hours of the doctors trying to convince her that this is the best possible course of action for her to take, Amber still refused the surgery. The doctors and hospital even went as far as taking her to court in order to obtain legal guardianship of her unborn child. Thankfully, their attempts were unsuccessful. However, Amber is not alone in her attempt to secure her right to natural childbirth. A 2008 documentary titled The Business of Being Born explores the difficult process that many hospitals put expectant mothers like Amber through. However, even three years later, this debate is still alive. An August 2010 study performed by the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute for Child Care and Human Development suggests that many obstetricians <coughs> give up on labor too soon and resort to surgeries to deliver babies rather than waiting for nature to take its course. This may be because many hospitals are putting their monetary needs first rather than the needs of the woman and her child. The SF Gate reported in August of 2010 that the maternal death rate in the United States is 17 per 100,000 women. And unfortunately, this number is rising every year. The hospital's birthing process is putting women through a dangerous system, and every year more women and children are put at risk. So in order to understand the hospital's birthing process, we must first find out what is going on at many of these hospitals that are putting women at risk. Next, discover the causes of these problems before finally taking a look at some ways that we can resolve this growing issue. Childbirth is an experience that is unique and personal to everyone. Women have been birthing for thousands of years, and only since the Industrial Revolution have humans begun to intervene with nature's natural process. Since then, as cultural anthropologist Robbie Davis Floyd states, America's deepest beliefs are centered around science, technology, patriarchy, and the institutions that control and disseminate them. This can become especially problematic for such a unique and complex process like childbirth, because when hospitals put expectant mothers through a dangerous process, the woman and child are put at risk. <coughs> for example, the Journal of Perinatal Education from spring of 2009 explains how 32-year-old Tasha French and her unborn child were in perfect condition when she went to the hospital to give birth. However, despite her reservations, the doctor wanted to use Cytotech to induce her labor. Unlike many women, Tasha knew that this drug was not FDA approved for use in labor. But since the doctor was so persistent, she proceeded. <coughs> Ten hours later, after being induced with Cytotech, Tasha and her baby girl, Zora, were dead. Like Tasha, the New York Times stated in August of 2010 that nearly half of all women who try vaginal deliveries have their labors induced, meaning half of all expected mothers will be put into similar situations like Tasha and Zora's. If this process of birth continues, then many more women and children will be at risk. It's obvious that the hospital's birthing system is scary. 
dangerous, and unnecessary. So let's investigate the causes. The causes are twofold. First, many hospitals act like businesses, trying to increase their turnover rate. And finally, patients are put at risk because of the lack of communication with their doctors. But first, many hospitals act like businesses, trying to increase their turnover rate in order to increase their profits. In many cases, doctors will resort to surgeries like cesarean sections, since they're so fast and convenient, despite the fact that a cesarean section is a major surgery and it costs more. Additionally, an August 2010 interview via email with cultural anthropologist Robbie Davis Floyd revealed the standardized process that many hospitals put expected mothers through. Dr. Floyd states that although responsible clinics should only admit women in active labor, five centimeters dilation, many hospitals are admitting women in early labor, one to two centimeters dilated. This is a marked difference since upon admittance, patients are given Pitocin in order to speed up the process. Pitocin-induced contractions are much stronger and harder to bear than normal contractions, so an epidural is administered in order to ease the pain. However, as Dr. Floyd states, since the woman is still in early labor, the epidural slows down the labor process, necessitating more Pitocin and a resultant higher dose of the epidural. Dr. Floyd states that this process exists as a way for doctors to get through more patients in a less amount of time. And these additional doses can lead to fetal distress. In many less extreme cases, if the medication hadn't been administered so early on during labor in the first place, then the woman could have had a less strenuous, natural, healthy birth. And finally, patients are put at risk because of the lack of communication with their doctors. This may be because society has scared women into believing that birth is a scary experience. As a result, the previously cited documentary, The Business of Being Born, explains that when a doctor presents an option to the patient, the patient believes that this must be the only option available, when in reality, the doctor has not disclosed all possible avenues, just the one that he or she prefers. Also, many consultations of what to expect during delivery and what decisions should be made if anything were to go wrong in the delivery room are not discussed during the nine months of pregnancy. Decisions of what to do if anything were to go wrong during labor should not be discussed when the woman is in pain and tired. It's obvious that solutions are in order in order to improve the experience of birth. Solutions exist on a governmental and personal level. First, on a governmental level, all states need to adopt the Maternity Information Act. The Alliance for the Improvement of Maternity Services website, accessed September of 2010, explains that the Maternity Information Act would require all hospitals with obstetric services to design a brochure disclosing annual rates of cesarean sections, vaginal births after cesarean sections, deliveries in birthing rooms, and more. The Maternity Information Act has only been passed in Massachusetts and New York, but it needs to be passed in every state to ensure that the public and pregnant women have access to obstetric intervention rates in their community. Second, on a personal level, there are two actions that people can do in order to improve the experience of birth. First, mothers-to-be or those who plan to have children need to educate themselves of the risks and benefits of hospital births, as well as other options of birth. An alternative to a hospital birth is using a midwife or a birthing center. The National Association for Certified Professional Midwives website states that midwives act as autonomous health professionals that are experienced in out-of-hospital births. Birthing centers offer home-like environments that many hospitals cannot provide. In both cases, the nurses, midwives, and sometimes doctors are all well-equipped and experienced to handle all kinds of birth, as well as any complications that may arise during delivery. And second, for those of you who either cannot or do not plan to have children, you can make a difference in your area by becoming a grassroots advocate stats ambassador to help support the Maternity Information Act and collect obstetric intervention rates for all 50 states. The public, especially expecting mothers, have the right to know what to expect from the hospitals 
and birthing centers in your community. Just email info at thebirthsurvey.com for more information. Today, we explore the dangerous process that many hospitals put expectant mothers through. First, we took a look at what's going on at many of these hospitals that are putting women at risk. Next, discover the causes of these problems before finally taking a look at some ways that we can resolve this growing issue. Now, I'm not advocating that hospitals are the worst places for women to give birth. However, hospitals need to take a step back and look at how they are treating women and the delivery of their children. In the case of Amber Marla, she was able to switch hospitals before the courts came to a decision and ended up giving birth to a healthy baby girl. If Amber hadn't taken a stand against the process that her hospital was trying to put her through, then the outcomes could have been much worse. Speaker is someone I've had the joy of working with now for about a year and a half. And I remember uh, her as a novice uh, in prose interpretation. And she has grown so much that last year at the state championships, she and her duo partner took the silver medal in duo interpretation. And that's in the entire state. So, prose interpretation is where we take something from a, from a short story or a novel. And you might ask, well, what's it doing in speech and debate? Well, we believe that like speeches can persuade, so can stories or novels or plays. And we believe that authors also have something to say or to communicate to us. And so I'm very happy to be introducing one of the most talented people on our team doing her prose interpretation for this year, Paris Player. Play for my stuff routine. 
It's all about folk stuff and how we need to store stuff and how our lives are about accumulating stuff and how we need a bigger house to keep all our stuff in. I've heard it before. My mother used to have a trucker boyfriend who played Carla Tate in this 18 wheeler as he drove. One night as Carla expressed his outrage at our need to keep and store stuff, the trucker exclaimed with pride, I own all my dang stuff, miss her truck. <laughs> my mother didn't like being considered somebody's owned stuff. So at the next truck stop, she gathered all our stuff and we became minus items on his stuff list. No one is far from his stuff. By habit, we arranged it so if we were to pass out, we pass out on our stuff, so we'd wake if anybody were to try to steal any of our stuff. I watch as Gotti rises for her turn in the bathroom, and I realize that none of us is offended that she takes all of her stuff with her. That's Virginia life, a little place to keep your stuff. And man, I think not having a house Living on the street, you sort of become stuff. You're the stuff people have to deal with. Move past. Get by without being guilty into digging out some change. And our stuff, our stuff is the homeless problem stuff. You know, some shelters let you keep some stuff there, but they go through it. Throw some of your stuff out if they feel like it. And the cops, the cops always trying to take your stuff. Believe me, privacy <coughs> is not for the homeless. But I have a secret. There are these lockers at the Trans Bay, and I have a key with a, a little orange square on it. I keep it tied around my waist so if anybody were to steal my other stuff, they wouldn't get my key. One bitter cold morning, I woke up and I couldn't swallow. I got up and I, I fell back down. I woke up at General Hospital. I tried to explain to them that I had to get my stuff. I ripped at the cords that ran through me until they had to tie my hands down. I had to get my stuff. Your stuff can wait. A doctor said as he inserted something into my IV that made me not care about my stuff anymore. <laughs> when I was released, I headed to the Trans Bay. I knew I shouldn't probably going. I, I knew my stuff wasn't going to be there. It's just and when you leave your house, you got to fuck it up. Wouldn't want somebody to come by and take some stuff. My heart pounds as I unfurl the key from around my waist. I slide it in. It does not move. I know them. They come with their tools, take out the lock, a new key inserted. This one's new key is gone. So I know someone else's stuff is in there. Someone who probably lives by Carlin's words. That's what your house is for. A little place to keep your stuff. While you go out and get it, more stuff. I knock my head against the locker until I feel a hand on my shoulder. I turn around and there's some short woman standing in front of me, holding out her hand. I know her. She's the one who confiscates stuff. Get out of my face. I want to spit, but I also don't want to go to GB. So I just duck out of her reach and start to scream for the exit. Wait, I have your stuff. I keep walking because it takes a minute to sink in. Where? Where is it? Where's my stuff? It's in the lower locker over there. Here. This is your key. Don't lose it. Why you gotta make it sink? I try to detach myself the way I do when men hand me money and start to do my pants. Slide the key in.
the lock clicks. There are all my notebooks wrapped up in twine like the schoolboys of olden days. I slide them out. I just sit and stare at them. We have now come to the last event of the evening, our parliamentary debate. <laughs> parliamentary debate is one of three different forms of debate that happen in competition. But for Modesto Junior College, par parliamentary debate really kind of holds a very special spot in our hearts. Uh, back in 1995, Dr. Charles Ewing was the director of the speech team here on campus, and he happened to go to a tournament back east, and he saw a form of debate called parliamentary debate, which wasn't being competed in California. And he really enjoyed the process because it just seemed like it was more fun, it was more lively, the argumentation was much more simple to follow, and he believed that this was a form of debate that needed to come to California. And so at that time, Dr. Ewing was also holding a tournament here on campus, and he decided to start parliamentary debate as one of the events at that tournament. And from that year, 1995, parliamentary debate has exploded on the West Coast and exploded throughout the nation, so that now it really is the number one style of debate that happens in competition. Parliamentary debate is more of an impromptu type of debate. In competition, the debaters will debate six different times, but they have no idea what they're going to be debating until 20 minutes before each round. And then 20 minutes before that round, they get the resolution, they find out whether they're going to be on the affirmative side or the negative side, and then for those 20 minutes, they prepare their arguments. For you this evening, we gave our four debaters a little bit of heads up a couple of days ago so they could start thinking about the arguments and hopefully bring some stronger arguments to the debate tonight. 
but certainly we want it to be a, a lively, fun debate as well. <laughs> One of the other aspects of parliamentary debate is that it really is, follows after the British Parliament. And in the British Parliament, there is a period where if you really enjoy what you're hearing in the British Parliament, that they pound their feet on the floor or they'll knock the seat in front of them and say, here, here, here. And to the speaker, that indicates that, hey, this audience likes what I'm saying. So, you know, if I'm trying to get a bill passed in the parliament, they're liking what I'm saying. I'm going to keep on this routine. I'm going to keep this information flowing so that hopefully they really go along and vote for my side at the end of all of this debate. So this evening, we want you as an audience to feel free that when you hear arguments that you like, feel free to say, hear, hear. Yes. Hear, hear. Let's practice that. Hear, hear. Excellent. Excellent. So when you hear those ideas like, oh, we're going to get to go home soon? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Excellent. So this evening with these four debaters, on the affirmative side, we have Nathaniel Walden and Mustafa Anas. I, go ahead. I mentioned that last weekend our debate team went to a tournament at the University of Santa Clara and Nathan and Mustafa took home quarterfinalist awards from that tournament. Excellent. <laughs> On the opposition side, we have Gilbert Martinez and J.R. Berlou. Gilbert Martinez wasn't able to go to the tournament this past weekend, but last semester was in the elimination rounds and took home quarterfinalist awards last fall semester as well. So at our upcoming tournament, I'm expecting big things from Gilbert. J.R. Berlou was Danielle Ramos's partner last weekend. So he and Danielle were the two people who took second place at the University of Santa Clara last weekend. But I guess a little small thing that I also should mention is that J.R. Berlou, with a different partner last year, ended the year as the Community College National Champion, Mr. J.R. Berlou. Modesto Junior College continues to have state and national champions every single year. And we'll do that again this year. We'll bring those trophies home for all of you guys. So this evening, the very final debate will begin with the idea that the United States should have stricter gun control. Mr. Mustafa Anas, our first speaker. Testing? All right, cool. Uh, first off, I'd uh, like to say that we, me and Nathan have decided to name our team Team Cutie Pies, so you know, it's really good. Okay, uh, the resolution we have today is the U.S. should have stricter gun control. Uh, observation one, resolution analysis. This is a policy round, guys, because it is calling for a clear call to action, right? Our definitions are going to be defined contextually. Observation two criteria, this is a net benefits round, and that's going to play a huge role in how you're going to be deciding who the winner is of this debate. Okay, uh, let's talk about a little background. Uh, like I said, the affirmative side stands firm that we should have stricter gun controls. Uh, currently, minors and the mentally ill or criminals are able to freely purchase weapons through private sales. Uh, there are currently 33 states that neither prohibit or substantially regulate this secondary market selling. Uh, so basically, with that said, uh, there are only seven states that require background checks on all gun sales, right? And the states that do have background checks, even though they have them, they're very inefficient. Okay, so that leads me into our plan over here. Okay, so we want to put forth a comprehensive gun control bill that will make it a federal law 
to do background checks via a new upgraded database. In this upgraded database, we will have the mentally unstable who should be able to carry a weapon, like the guy who, who did that mass shooting in Arizona, or people who are criminals won't be able to have these weapons, right? Okay, uh, let's move on to our advantage one, to our plan, right? Why is our plan needed, you might ask? That's a very good question that I'm going to answer right now. Uh, make it, advantage one, it's going to make it more difficult for criminals or anyone deemed yeah, Yes, Mr. J.R. Blue. All right, so all you're doing is background checks. You're not limiting magazines or anything to that effect. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, no, good point, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention more on that. Uh, we are, li we are limiting, we are doing background checks, and also we are limiting magazines. Thank you for that clarification, sir. Uh, appreciate it. Okay, what so... What are being limited to? Ten rounds. Ten rounds, thank you. Okay, so, on to our plan. Uh, sorry for the confusion. Okay, on to our plan. Like I said, we're going to make it more difficult for criminals or anyone deemed unable to purchase firearm, right? Okay, so... Uh, currently, any criminal can buy a gun from a private dealer, right? Right now, if you wanted a gun, it would be very easy for you to escape a background check and getting one. And we as the affirmative side think that's a very big problem, right? You can't, I mean, we want, the common man wants a gun to be able to protect himself, right? And that's fair, we're in full support of that, right? But if you're like some mentally unstable person and you want to escape this background check, right now it's really easy to do that, right? And our plan makes it so that that's not the case. Advantage two. It eliminates the gun show loophole. Like I said, let's move on. If you wanted to buy a gun, you would just have to go to the gun show. And I'm not talking about these guns, right? I'm talking about actual guns, right? All right. You go to a gun show, and you're not going to get a background check. You just can't do the sucker, and you're good to go. People just want to make money, right? Got a question? Yes, sir. Uh, will they hand you a pistol without a background check? One more time. Will they hand you a pistol? Or you know, I'm going to let my partner address that. I'm going to go into my final advantage here. That, that question will be answered, though. I'm not escaping the question. I'm not scared of this guy. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we're going to eliminate high-capacity magazines, which will hamper the ability for criminals to perform mass shootings, right? Just like the guy from Arizona. Uh, if any of you guys remember, instances like the one in Arizona and earlier in Virginia Tech will be less likely to happen. In Arizona, a mentally ill a uh, person fired a 30 round clip and killed 13 people and he wasn't tackled until he had to reload. We as the affirmative team feel that if our plan was at stake, this guy would have only had 10 rounds to shoot and in essence, he probably would have killed maybe two people, three people, you know? So we feel that our plan is definitely needed for a safer society. Thank you. Vote Team Kitty Pie. Thank you, Mr. Honors. Now we will have a speech from J.R. Berlou for four minutes. Your time has started. <laughs> First of all, I am also a big fan of team names, and uh, our motto pretty much is going to be double tap, which is also the case. <laughs> uh, right, let's start off with my first point, and that is going to be um, that we don't agree with their background argument. First of all, there is a background check necessary, and they say that the private sector doesn't do so. And my argument is that in order to gain solvency, they actually have to have some type of enforcement because the private sector won't have any incentive to stop selling these guns because they get profit out of it. So when you just tell them to do, uh, to do these background checks, which they're already required to do, they're just not going to do it. You can't just tell them to do it and expect it to happen. So uh, with that said, um, I think solvency is a very important thing that we look to into debate. To, into debate. Uh, so well, while their plan might sound good and, uh, and, and just on its face, uh, there are really some serious problems with solvency, and they're not going to access any of their advantages because of it. Let's first of all look to the, uh, the issue of mental health. And you, if you're flowing this debate around, you can look at, to this as an overview on all of their advantages and also their background. And uh, the point here is the Arizona shooter uh, was mentally ill, correct, but it was not on his background because he was not receiving <coughs> services for his mental illness. And when he is not in the system, he can still buy the gun. Therefore, they cannot access any solvency on this issue, and uh, you're not going to see any change by voting. There we go. By voting affirmative. So, with that said, yeah. Yeah. Okay. with that said, uh, that's why you're going to be voting Team Double Tap on insolvency. But let's look next, uh, next to uh, how they don't gain access to any of their advantages 
because uh, on what, what they tell you with the, uh, the difficult to purchase. Uh, my first response to this is that of the black market is essentially just going to push things to the black market to where people can still access guns. In your mentally unstable you have a history of felonies, you can still buy that gun and walk out on the same day. It's called anti-gun law. With our comprehensive gun control bill, we're going to eliminate that completely. Um, yeah, that's good, that's good. And, and body armor, this whole idea that, well, if the suspect shows up in body armor, uh, well, how are you going to stop him? Well, it's just, I guess you're kind of out of luck then. You can also show up in a tank and you want to go into the fire. And so there would be no incentive for the private dealers to follow this. Um, is prison a good enough of an incentive for you to follow the law? I think it is. Um, so yeah, so they don't follow this law, they're going to prison, plain and simple. Okay. And thank you very much. Thank you, Todd. Go ahead. And now Gilbert Martinez performing this. Alright, how are you guys doing today? He said about you know about our stats about a person coming in a tank. Well, that's pretty rare, wouldn't you guys say? I mean, if we could buy a, if we could buy a tank, I'd buy one and I just drive to school, dude. Never have a problem with parking ever again. Uh, body armor. He says you're out of luck. Well, body armor can only take so many bullets, but I'll tell you right now, it will take ten bullets. Um, Point of information. Uh so, in the body armor, how do you know body armor is not going to take 30 bolts, 40 bolts, 50 bolts, 60 bolts, 70 bolts? Well, I'm sorry, I'm sure it will take more than 10. You're pretty sure, but you're not positive. Okay. Okay, okay. all right. Put your life on it, sir. Put your life on it. How many of you guys remember the Hollywood shootout? How many rounds did those guys take? Yeah. Right? They took a lot more than 10 bullets. Okay. Second of all, they said, uh, how many people get shot and, like, live? How about all the people who have purple hearts? What about all the people who get hearts? Army, Navy, or the armed forces, they all survive gunshots. So maybe we're not all 50 cent and we can't survive nine bullets. But we sure can survive one, so... <laughs> right? Um, they say we have no control over the black market. Well, we have influence over it. We could technically stop the drug trade if we would just stop smoking pot, or doing crack, or whatever it is that we're into. I'm not going to judge, but I'm saying if you were to stop completely, that whole market's done. Point of information, uh, would you also agree that you could completely stop the illegal gun trade just by giving everyone an AK-47 and let them go at it? Yeah, they influence over that. Okay, um, they talk about the databases, how we have a bunch of people who aren't, like, registered for that stuff, but the reason they're not registered is because they're not receiving the treatment, so even if we decide Hey, we're gonna make this new law where it's gonna put people. Well, if they're not receiving treatment, then that's not on record that they have it. So that whole database goes down the drain, and it's again. Yeah. Um, so then I'd like to go back to our points about uh, self-defense and uh, ten rounds. Well, there's a lot of things that you know we might need more than ten rounds. Um, I don't know why you guys can see me out there. I'm pretty Mexican myself. I've lived on ranches, been horseback riding, cowboy boots, and all, man. So, I mean, like, I lived in all those places where you have to take your, like, animals and stuff, and, like, you know, coyotes and crap. <laughs> oh, well, that's my language, but, um, those are some little, you know, wild little animals. They're not going to get any longer than 10 rounds, right? So I gotta say. Um, uh, right, they, you know, they dropped the advantages of uh, my partner here. And since they dropped them, scientists can, you know, they didn't mention anything, so that means a point to go to us. And this is a net benefit, right? Yeah, net benefits, so that means a point should Which go to Which advantage did we drop? I'm sorry. You just didn't respond to the response. Which one? Which one? All three. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so, continuing on now. Um, they really don't. They really don't like, show any reasonable bill on like how their laws are going to stop any of this, any of the mass shootings or anything at all. Because um, like we said, you know, I mean, their best thing to a guy with body armor as well is you're out of luck. Let me tell you right now, if there's a person with a gun, who would you rather be? Would you rather be the guy, you know, in the body armor with a gun or the person who's just watching you out of luck? I'm pretty sure most of us would choose a person with a gun now. 
Um, so, I mean, <laughs> hey, if it's just one, that's fine. <laughs> All right, so, I mean, if that's the best response, just you're out of luck. Uh, all right, well, Thank you very much. Thank you for that. We'll, know, we'll now go into the final two speeches, which are called rebuttals, where one person from each side will explain why you will vote for them. And so we will begin with the opposition and J.R. Berlou. All right, rule number four is double tap. And that's why you're voting for us, because we want you to have the right to double tap, and you're not going to have that with the affirmative plan. Yeah. Okay. Let's first of all start off with my solvency press, which they actually conceded to. And in debate, it's really important that you show that you have the capability to solve for the problems you talk about, or else we don't really get any real world education out of this debate round because they're just saying, oh, this is what we should do, even though it won't work. We need to see a plan that actually works. And when they show you nothing that can actually solve for the problems I mentioned, like mental illness, the people that don't actually uh, get into the system because they're not receiving care, like the Arizona situation, like the Virginia Tech situation, we see that they do not have the ability to solve, therefore you should not accept their plan. But on the net benefits issue, let's first of all take a look at the disadvantages. The first disadvantage, they completely concede this by saying we don't have any control over the black market. Well, they're saying that, oh, well, we have for the affirmative team and we can't control this, we control what we can. My argument is that, I'm sorry, but that's debate, and when I bring up the point that you can't refute, doesn't mean that it's okay for you not to respond to it. The bottom line is, the black market will be fueled by this plan, and it's going to turn into a worse situation. This is conceded by the affirmative team, and on a net benefit scale where you're weighing advantages versus disadvantage, you have to go with the negative. Let's move on to the second disadvantage, and this is where a lot of the debate has come down to. Okay, first of all, they said they were not as beastly as 50 Cent, which, uh, I mean, I could, could you know, say that I'm beastlier, but um, I'm white, so. <laughs> Bottom line is, even if we're not all 50 Cent, as my partner said, people with purple hearts in the military show that you can't take a bullet and not die. Their contention that one bullet kills someone is completely false. And the bottom line is, like I said in the first speech, people are nervous when they're shooting and trying to defend their property and their family, and they need more than 10 shots in some cases. And if you give them the opportunity to shoot you and have body armor and you don't have enough bullets to defend yourself, you're going to be uh, uh, dying and you're going to be looking at this disadvantage to where we're decreasing our safety. So the bottom line is you're, you're going to be voting on this disadvantage. Um, look to where they say that, uh, look to where my partner's argument, A, that you're not going to be seeing uh, someone drive around in a tank in Modesto, or else we'll probably like bomb them with an airplane or something. I don't know. <laughs> but their argument that like, well, well, they'll have something more uh, heavy, they're saying that that's, it sucks for you if you don't have, or if they have body armor. You have more shots at a headshot if you have more ammo in your, uh, in your magazine, so the bottom line is that you're going to have a better chance at living if you have more ammunition, which is why you should not vote for the affirmative. Uh, look also to the argumentation of coyotes um, by my partner, and I think he did a really good job of articulating on how coyotes can be a real problem, and uh, if you want to protect your cattle or your family from them, or yourself, you should have the right to do so and not run out of ammunition. Okay, yeah, yeah. so, rule number 23 is God bless Fred. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now for our final speech, Mr. Mustafa Anas will explain why you should vote for the affirmative. Okay, uh, so I'm basically going to tell you why you're going to be voting Team Pie today. But let's first start off with one major contradiction that the opposition team, I don't know if you guys picked up on it. I remember earlier when we were talking about the guy from Arizona who went crazy. He said, oh, well, if he only had 10 rounds, he could just reload real quick, and then he could have killed more people. Now, let's just think about that for one second. Let's think about that for one second. They talk about right coyotes in the, in the member of opposition speech. Oh, man, 10 rounds isn't going to be good enough. Well, buddy, can't you just reload and kill some more coyotes? I don't understand. That's a major Wrong. We talked about our hasty generalization argument. The opposition had a response, but they said, well, what about guys who have purple hearts? They clear, they show clearly that you can you can take a bullet and live. Well, we as the affirmative team, we're not arguing that at all. He said 50 cent got shot nine times and didn't die. We said, give me another guy who got shot nine times and didn't die. He just told me someone who got shot once and didn't die. Can't really agree with them there either, guys. Again, hasty 
General H would basically get off of one superhuman rapper guy who can take nine bullets. Congratulations, buddy, but that's the only example you got. You gotta drop that one right then and there. That's another reason. Okay, so another thing they talked about is, here's something I'd like to bring up to you guys' attention too when you vote. They said, well, you know, if you can double tap, let's think about team double tap here. Let's say, let's say someone has an assault rifle and they can double tap. Aren't they more likely to kill more people? When we think about this from someone who could be mentally ill, like what happened in Arizona, what if you had a double tap gun? I'm pretty sure you would have killed more than 13 people. I don't know, though. I'm just, I'm just throwing off a long shot there. You know, you, you can shoot twice as many bullets. Are you not going to kill twice as many people? So you really got to think about that also from that standpoint. You got to drop that right off the bat, too. We as the affirmative team are trying to provide a safer environment for the common man. We want people who want protection for themselves stone guns, not people who want to go crazy on governors and the public and Virginia Tech students. We're trying to protect you guys from these things. And that's why, and that's why we have a plan to where our background checks are going to be more efficient than what is going on right now. And by having a more efficient background check, people who are more reliable will have guns. They will be able to ex exercise that Second Amendment and we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about people who aren't capable of having a gun or that kind of responsibility actually having one. So now I've responded to a majority of the arguments. They said we dropped their first three advantages. Well, maybe I wasn't listening. I don't remember what those three advantages were. But regardless, we're cuter and we sound better, so you're going to vote for them today. Thank you very much. And so debates always have to have that final decision. And so with a round of applause, those that would vote for the affirmative. Thank you.